guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. We're gonna do some free love for you guys in a non-creepy way, traveling back not to the 1960s, but into the 1860s, taking a look at the United Community, an example of a utopian society that existed for about 30 years. This came from as a suggestion from a Twitter follower, Miss Hollywood. Really great suggestion, really great piece of history. So let's go do her up nice. Here we go, guys, giddy up for the <laughs> That's the dude right there. He's the founder of the Oneida community, which uh, is a community that sprung up around 1848. It lasted for about 30 years to about 1878, right there in central New York. Uh, Johnny Boy came from a very influential family in Vermont. His father was actually a congressman, and he was going into the ministry, Dartmouth College. He was studying to be a minister, um, and he adopted a philosophy of piece of religion called perfectionism. And perfectionism basically was kind of the opposite of what everyone else believed as Calvinists, that man was full of sin and we needed to kind of, uh, you know, redeem ourselves in order to get to the, you know, the heaven, the promised land, where we would then live without sin and we could do all pleasurable stuff. A perfectionist believes that uh, man already can live without sin. Johnny Boy didn't feel much guilt and he really thought that he could be holy and live a life of pleasure, believing that eventually he would proclaim that Jesus had come back in 8070 or something like that, so the millennial kingdom could start now, and he was going to get it started. So we started that community in 1848. Let's take a look at some of their beliefs, because some of them are pretty crazy. Mr. Trouble never hangs around when he hears this mighty sound. They were communists, dirty communists. They were communists, yeah, in the sense that they believed in a stateless society with no private ownership, and they ran everything by committee. I think they had 30 or 40 committees, a whole bunch of bureaucracy for 300 people. They employed 200 people, but they definitely didn't believe in that idea of being attached to private property, so they owned everything communally, and they did adopt that kind of concept of communitarianism or communism. So that was number one, Dirty Red. <laughs> Two, they were getting freaky. Uh, they believed in a concept called complex marriage, that nobody really could marry anybody else, that everybody was married to each other. There was no kind of sense of ownership over anybody else. So in a sense, it's kind of a feminist ideology because women had equal status with men. Even though women, for the most part, did the domestic duties, they were free to participate in the decision-making and they could uh, definitely apply their skills if they were uh, wanted to be a carpenter, if they wanted to do something um, in the trade business or something like that. One of the rules that they had was that they could cohabitate, but they had to have a third party okay that, uh, that, that rule. And if anybody was getting too close, if there was any of this kind of sense of a couple forming, they were separated. They, they were like physically separated by the community. So a complex marriage was probably the one that was most controversial in the larger sense, but there's definitely some other ones. So let's take a look at some of the other freakier ones. <laughs> Are you ready for this one? They believe basically that sex had two purposes. One in the sense of, of bonding with another human being, sharing that experience, a pleasure kind of aspect, and then for uh, procreation. So they decided, and this could have been because his wife, I think, had five stillbirths or something like that, that they would be able to have sex with each other and anybody could have sex with anybody, but they would not reach, can I say that on YouTube, ejaculation? Yeah, they wouldn't do that. So they would basically, and they believed like in a spiritual orgasm, they could orgasm without fulfilling the deed. And they wouldn't even finish when they were done. So they really believed in this concept that if you did, I'm getting a little creepy, guys, if you did orgasm, that that would like spent your spirit. So in a sense, it operated like being a contraceptive. So women had power and men had power and they could have this sexual relationship without worrying about children. Hashtag creepy. <laughs> gets a little creepier with Ascending Fellowship. So one of the fears was that young people would fall in love with each other and they wouldn't buy into this idea. So basically Ascending Fellowship was kind of like a mentor sex program where the women, if you were past menopause because you couldn't get pregnant, would teach the adolescent boys um, how to practice 
the male continence. So basically like the pleasure of, yeah, you get the idea. And the other way around too, where the male leaders would pick out the young girls and they would teach them as well. That was, that was how they did the teaching. of us for the rest of us. Uh, mutual criticism is the last one that I'll go over, one of their beliefs, where in order to improve yourself, they would have, you know, in the Seinfeld episode, it was called the airing of grievances, where they'd go around the table and they would just pile on you all the terrible things that you needed to know about yourself. And they would do that, even to the leaders, they would sit there and the community would go, you suck, and let me tell you why. So I guess it made them better. <laughs> is a free-loving communist, baby. <laughs> Charles Guiteau, maybe not a free-loving communist, but did live in Oneida, the United Community in New York, which was a free love, kind of open marriage, communitarianism, kind of share everything kind of society. They didn't like him very much. They nicknamed him Charles Guiteau, and they actually kicked him out. <laughs> It's always the son. Uh, John Noyes passes the torch, theoretical torch of power, down to his son Theodore around 1876. And Theodore, being an agnostic, really doesn't have the, uh, I guess, the fever for it all. And there becomes a power struggle, and the community ends up uh, breaking up. And actually became a silverware company that I believe the joint stock company still exists today, even though they've moved their manufacturing bases probably to China like everybody else. But at the end of the day, it's a really great example of a try at a utopian community with some really divergent thinking and uh, belief systems that not many people know about that existed in the 19th century. So giddy up for the learning, guys. We hope that you learn a little bit. Maybe your brain's a little bit bigger. And if you haven't subscribed to Hip Use History, we have over 350 videos, which is cray cray all by itself. You can subscribe right there by hitting that big funky red button. How much fun does that look to be? And we'll see you guys next time that you press my button. And I always say it, and I mean it, where attention goes, energy flows.